Here's something people with lives have never had to argue about. When or what was the first gore movie made? It's actually kind of hard to say because movies were gory for about as long as they were the movies. The point of the earliest motion pictures was pure spectacle, and what's more spectacular than sex and or violence, and violence is a lot easier to fake. Remember, the original Shakespeare productions may not have had sets, elaborate props, or actresses, but they did have leftover blood and animal parts from the local butcher to throw around and simulate gore. The early blockbuster epics that built Hollywood as we know it as its own individual filmmaking entity were so often historical epics or biblical narratives precisely because those genres allowed spectacle specialists like D.W. Griffith and Cecil B. DeMille to pack their movies with displays of opulent wealth, huge battle scenes, orgies both literal and figurative of debauchery and graphic violence, while having the ready-made response to the would-be morality police of, hey, we're just depicting what the books say happened. You might even say it's educational. But then the Hayes Code about graphic sex and violence came in and spoiled the party for a couple decades, so spectacle-style bloodshed retreated largely to the sidelines, even in nations without a code for the most part. See, the other taboo about on-screen violence was a somewhat real concern in some quarters that, just as preventing actors from actually engaging in real sex acts was thought to help prevent exploitation, especially of actresses, by unscrupulous producers, him, that people might go too far for the art and actually hurt someone on screen. And before you laugh at that, remember, in those old Robin Hood movies when people got shot with arrows, the preferred way of doing that was to put armor and padding on the stuntmen and shoot them with actual arrows. And hell, more recently, there are a lot of not-that-long-ago killer animal and jungle cannibal movies that people have mentioned for Schlocktober that are never going to be on the show because they were created using real stage-for-the-camera live animal violence that I'm just not going to show here. Anyway, gore movies started to creep back into the Hollywood mainstream when Hitchcock did Psycho, which had on-screen blood and a corpse and was really nasty for the time, but the dam really broke in the U.S. side when some of the low-end indie people making what were then called the nudie movies, which was the campy transitional genre in between the roughies or stag films of the 50s and pre-war era, and outright pornography, decided, you know, we've probably filmed every kind of breasts from every kind of angle, people might be getting bored, maybe we should throw some red paint around, call it blood, and now we're making horror movies. Herschel Gordon Lewis' Blood Feast from 1963 is generally considered the first of these gore films, and Lewis himself the godfather of gore. <laughs> But if you follow this stuff, it's likely you've heard of him and those. Our subject for today came out one year later, is a touch more obscure, but has its own not insignificant place in the history of gore cinema, B-movies, and, well, you'll see. Okay, you gotta admit, as cold opens go, someone jumps off a boat and melts inexplicably in the middle of the ocean is pretty damn different for 1964. But things get pretty quickly more familiar in a Your Great Grandma's Daily Soap Operas kind of way, which is actually where they got most of these actors, as we get to the main characters and the story, in which square-jawed, grimly taciturn, no-nonsense, all-American, tough-guy pilot for hire, Grant Murdoch. Now wait a minute, lady. If this is some process service gag just to make me admit that I'm Grant Murdoch, you're gonna wish you hadn't pulled it. Total sploosh. Actually, yeah, gotta give him the sploosh. And whatever my equivalent of sploosh is, which I guess is just sploosh. Only with semen. Is hired to fly obnoxious over-the-hill actress and rampaging alcoholic Laura Winters and her overworked assistant from New York to Cape Cod, despite an incoming storm. He's reluctant, she's insistent, he could really use the money, so guess what happened? No, no!
but it turns out they aren't alone on wherever this small uncharted rock that's definitely not just the coast of Long Island is supposed to be. There's also literally the last thing you want to find after crash landing on any island in any black and white movie, a German mad scientist. <laughs> I'm very sorry if I frightened you. This equipment must make me look like one of those creatures from a horror film. This is actor Martin Koslick, by the way, and if he seems familiar, it's probably because you've seen him many times before doing this same kind of role. Koslick was a German-born character actor who'd been a vocal anti-Nazi activist prior to World War II who managed to escape to the United States. After the war, while many German actors resented constantly being offered roles as the Nazi bad guy, Koslick considered it something of a moral obligation to portray the Nazis as evil bastards as often as possible, so he pretty much took every role like that he could get his hands on. He even played Joseph Goebbels five different movies. I should have recognized you, but... You see, I have so little time for motion pictures. Skip it, Professor. I'm not big on marine biology either. Now, here he's playing a German-American scientist named Bartel, who'd been drafted as a spy to infiltrate a Nazi bioweapon research during the war, and is now on this island because, well, there's something in the water. <laughs> What a shame. The poor woman never had a chance. What caused it? Sharks, I guess. Okay, so what's going on? I told you there was something fantastic going on out here! Scientists certainly do not claim to know everything, only quacks do. But what you are about to do is extremely dangerous. How do you know? Oh, I would guess that these fish have been destroyed by some microscopic parasite. There's a possibility the same parasite could be transferred to your body if you should touch them. Yep, that's what's going on here. How cheap is the flesh eaters? The flesh eaters themselves are microorganisms, a cloud of water dwelling, invisible to the human eye creatures, represented on screen by bare minimum optical effects, throwing some dry ice and bloody props in the water, and having the actors scream very, very loud. Although at least one of the low tech effects used to visualize this is nothing if not extremely unique looking. <laughs> I need bandages, strips of cloth, anything! how they do that? It's a really old analog rotoscoping trick. They poked or burned holes into specific points on each frame of the original raw film of the scene so that when the subsequent prints are run through the projector, the full pure light from the projector bulb pierces right through clear celluloid. Effective, huh? It also helped make the good home video copies of this difficult to make for a while because you have to transfer it in a specific way to recreate the effect and it's not like a lot of people were screaming out for this movie. In any case, the flesh eaters are of course the Nazi experiment Bartel was infiltrating, now they're loose in the ocean, and he's got a big array of mad science stuff on the island, supposedly used to track and try to find a way to destroy them. Oh, and he's also evil, crazy, and wants to reclaim and weaponize them himself, and he's scheming to kill everybody, but you already figured that out. Oh, and since we're a short one, won't be missed person for a proper body count, an annoying beatnik shows up. Hey, hey! He doesn't last long. Pretty kooky idea, huh? Yes, very kooky. And now we drink. Listen to those screams, they're eating him alive! Also, the Flesh Eaters kill a random boat guy, and Bartel kills the actress because bad guy. So Bartel's theory is that electricity will stun the Flesh Eaters, and he can harvest them for his own purposes. Turns out, he's wrong. Like, super wrong. <laughs> Thank you. 
instead, electricity makes them Voltron together into one really big flesh eater. <laughs> Fortunately, the actress was only mostly dead, comes back swinging for Bartel, and instead inadvertently discovers the monster's real weakness. Die first! You want to eat? Here! Blood. They only eat flesh, but they are deathly allergic to blood, which is why their killings leave so much of it behind. So naturally, the way to beat them is to give Bartel a taste of his own medicine. <laughs> Wait for the ones in the ocean to go supersize, and then go at them with a giant-ass needle full of hemoglobin to the, I guess, face? Okay, so this thing was directed and produced by Jack Curtis and his wife Tenny Curtis, in part via her having won a bunch of money on a TV game show. Curtis was primarily a voiceover actor who worked on the English dubbing for a ton of early anime series. He was also the cinematographer using a pseudonym for union purposes. It was carefully storyboarded by screenwriter, comic book legend Arnold Drake, the creator of Doom Patrol and co-creator of Dead Man and the original Guardians of the Galaxy. Flesh Eater's most graphic scene, a Nazi experimentation flashback, was cut from most prints for featuring mild nudity. The film would probably have remained pretty obscure after that, if not for a quirk of history, its title still being copied copyrighted and trademarked three years later is the reason a young George A. Romero opted to change the title of his in-development black-and-white gore movie project from The Flesh Eaters to Night of the Living Dead.